Hey, this is the third and last segment of the sedimentary rocks. I just finished playing tennis and now I have to ice my wrist because I hurt it. But anyhow, I can do this um, narration. It's cool. So we just finished at the Coquina and it's crazy because I just realized that all I have left is three, five, five slides the most. But that's okay. We can do it. So the next type of uh, limestone is the fossiliferous limestone. The fossiliferous limestone is um, named for the fact that they always have visible fossils in them most of the time. And uh, these are like turitalas, you know, like snails. Other than that, the, the limestone itself is pretty fine grain, which means that they uh, settle down in relatively deep water. So the coquina and the oolitic limestone most of the time are going to be light colored because they form in an oxygen rich environment. But with the fossiliferous limestone, the color again doesn't really have much meaning. It just tells you how much oxygen was in the environment. So don't get scared if you see yellow, which I have mostly in the lab. If you see dark gray or green, whatever color it is, all it means is the environment and how much oxygen was it in it. What kind of uh, iron is in there? Is it like two charges or three charges? When when it's three charges, that means oxygen rich environment. And then you got like brownish yellow, red, <clears throat> reddish yellow colors. That means the the rock formed in an environment where there was a lot of oxygen means close to the surface or on the surface. On the other hand, when you have dark colored rocks, it just means that they formed in an environment where there is no oxygen so the iron have two charges and that's rather becoming like dark gray or dark green so that is the color meaning I already have told you but I don't think it's bad that I tell you again and again so the fossiliferous limestone is easy to know because it fizzes with hydrochloric acid it has fossils and it can ha have any color so don't get scared if you see fossils and it fizzes with uh, hydrochloric acid that you know it's fossiliferous limestone. It's that simple. The next one is the lime mudstone. The lime mudstone is very, very similar to the, to the siliciclastic mudstone. But the difference is it's easy. What is the difference? Remember, every limestone, when you put acid on it, gonna fizz. So this, if it fizzes with hydrochloric acid, you know it's lime mudstone. If it doesn't, then you know it's mudstone. So it's that simple, basically. Again, the color, don't worry about the color. It could be any color. As long as it fizzes with hydrochloric acid, you know you got lime mudstone. So it's simple. Do you, usually lime mudstone forms it in pretty deep environment. And now this here is the dolomites. So it's, this is the second group of the carbonates. Remember, we started with limestone, and now this is the dolomite. The difference between limestone and dolomite, the dolomite has some magnesium in it. So the formula of the dolomite is, or you will sometimes hear it as dolostone, so they are synonym. The dolomite is calcium, magnesium, CO3, because it has two uh, cation of 2 CO3 in it. So this is the formula for the dolomite or dolostone. Of course, you don't have to know it. I'm just telling you. All I want you to know is that the dolomite has some magnesium in it. The dolomite forms always with, from pre-existing limestone. So the first thing which settles down is lime mud. And then when the climate becomes really arid, uh, the the gypsum will start forming and gypsum needs a lot of calcium so then the calcium actually comes out of this lime mud which just freshly settled down and magnesium will go in to replace the calcium and that's how the dolomite is forming from pre-existing limestone that's how they call it so dolomite in texture and in every way extremely similar to the limestone. The only way you can uh, tell them apart is that when you put hydrochloric acid on the dolomite or dolostone, it will fizz just a little bit. So remember we did that with the minerals. So it fizz a little bit. Sometimes you actually have to scratch it with a scissor or a knife or a nail and then see that the low powdered uh, material will, will fizz easier than the rock itself so you always have to check this out okay this is dolomite remember dolomite is the first sign 
of arid climate, you know, extreme arid, clim arid climate means no rain. I'm talking about Abu Dhabi, the Sahara Desert, that area. So this takes us to the so-called evaporates, the evaporate group. And uh, these guys are in order, and I want you to know this order, the gypsum and hydrite, halite, and the sylvite. This order is the order of their solubility. How easily they dissolve in water, that's what I mean under solubility. So gypsum is the least soluble, and sylvite is the most soluble. Gypsum is calcium sulfide, sulfate, CaSO4. It has some water too. Two. The anhydrite is just calcium sulfate, SO4, with no water. And then you know the halite is the sodium chloride, which now we call rock salt because we're talking about sedimentary rocks. And then the sylvite is the potassium salt. This here is the most soluble. Basically, sylvite only will precipitate out of the ocean at extreme dry condition. And even the do um, the smallest moisture in the morning will dissolve it back. So that's how hard for sylvite to, to come out. So most of our salt deposits only have sodium chloride. It never will have the potassium chloride. And gypsum is the very first thing. As soon as it becomes arid, first thing which forms is dolomite, but right after is going to be gypsum, then anhydrite, and then halite, and then sylvite. So you have to know this in order. It's very important that you understand that you got to know it in order. I will have questions about this. So you do want to know it. And this one is the chert. The chert is microcrystalline silica. It's like quartz, the same thing. And you learn chert as a mineral and probably remember that it's actually SiO2. So it's microcrystalline silica. It could be any color again, so don't worry about the color. It's, you know, remember as a mineral, we learned that it's hardness of seven, that it has conchoidal fracture, it doesn't have any kind of cleavage, and uh, it will scratch the glass plate. You can always use the glass plate. Remember, it's in the plastic uh, box. Uh, so if it's an agate, usually it's banded. If it's jasper, it's red. If it's flint, it's black. So it could have different colors again, don't worry about it. They are usually very irregular. These are uh, the church, usually what we call diagenetic mineral. Because it usually not, not forming as the sediment is forming, but it forms later after the rock become rock. Um, most of the time, you know, if you have evaporate nodules, because it's an arid climate and all the carbonates are full with uh, evaporite nodules, like low holes. I'll show them in, in the lab for you. And um, then those um, evaporate dissolve, and then later on, uh, when the conditions are such, this silica will um, precipitate in the holes. So it is diagenetic, means it comes after the rocks become rock so it's during the diagenesis when it forms um like around here in in roanoke there is a lot of limestone old old limestone which are first full of chert nodules and remember what is the original name of roanoke some of you i'm sure knows that it's big lick and the the big lick name comes for the fact from the fact that the limestones are full with um salt and the animals used to come here to lick the salt. So that's why the name Big Lick is um, stick to Roanoke, so you know it now. But then, as I said, when those dissolved, chert went in and filled up those holes. And, and that's why we have so many uh, Native American Indian villages, because they came after the chert to make uh, arrowheads and, and knife and all those tools they used. The last sedimentary rock you will have to know is the coal. And probably you all know that the coal formation is a gradual formation. Usually it happens around coastal marshes or swamps. Uh, during humid climates, it has to be humid because it has to have a lot of plants. And when the, these lagoons or coastal swamp areas are very quiet and, and very calm water, 
So the only thing which settles down in them is clay. So as the tree, trees fall down because they die, they get covered up by clay, and the clay is so teeny tiny that oxygen cannot get through. So therefore, the organics cannot decay, and gradually in these swamps, coal is start forming. The first stage of the coal formation is the peat. The peat usually is 65% carbon. carbon, so basically can burn it and it will give you heat, but it has a lot of ash. It's about 35% ash. Now the next stage is the, you can still see all the roots and everything in the, in the peat. It's really, really light. It's full of these fossili, fossili, fossilized, um, roots. The next stage is the lignite. It has to get buried further down to be able to have lignite. It's 75% coal and 25% ash. And then you got the bituminous coal, which is like usually millions of years of burial and uh, becoming more and more gradually more carbon rich. It has 85% coal carbon, sorry, and 15% ash. Most of the West Virginia coal mines are bituminous coal. So those are like three, 350 million years old coals. Um, the bituminous coal is pretty good, you know, it gives very good heat. So this is what most of the mines producing in West Virginia, and that's what all the Appalachian power companies are burning. And then the last coal, which is really actually a metamorphosed coal, is the anthracite. Anthracite have 95% carbon and 5% ash. So this is the best coal. The problem is that we don't have enough. So most of the coal burning power plants are using uh, bituminous coal. And I have already mentioned that these guys, because they are oxygen-free environment, and when the iron has two charges, actually, it's, it, it likes to make minerals with sulfur, and the most common of it is the pyrite. And remember, we learned the pyrite as, as a mineral, and we said that there is no coal without pyrite, and that's what causes the problem, because when they burn the, burn the coal, the pyrite will react with the, with the uh, water and the oxygen and make sulfuric acid. So this is what produces the acid rain when they burn the coal. They, they have been trying to clean the pyrite out of the coal. And remember, this is where this problem in West Virginia happened, that, that, that coal washing liquid, which is very bad chemical, went into the drinking water. And I just heard on the news today that it's still causing major problems. Uh, people are getting sick from it and going to the hospital, so it's not good. You really have to be careful. But... The thing is that coal mining is not healthy, burning coal is not healthy, but at the same time, nobody wants to say no to electricity. And I know our effort should go toward uh, other type of alternate sources of electricity, but in this world, we don't have enough of it. And not very many houses have solar power um, on their roofs, which actually I think should be much cheaper so people could afford to do that and every house would be covered with solar panel because then we would need coal much, much, much less. So that would be an amazing solution, but we are not there yet. So this is the end, except I have this slide. This is the, the peat, the lignite, and bituminous coal. So... I hope you enjoyed the sediment learning about the sedimentary rocks and I will see you in the next chapter. Bye now.